Real quick, let me, let me note for you as well uh, that I'll be sending out, it'll, I'm still working on timing uh, just from when I can get it done, but somewhere between today and Tuesday, I'm going to be sending out uh, an email to you guys just with some thoughts about um, our uh, political season, our election cycle that's coming up. Please don't misunderstand me. This is not like, hey, here's Pastor Brian's list of endorsed candidates. There's nothing like that. This is very similar to if you remember over the last couple of years, there's been a couple of times I've preached about uh, just uh, Christian stewardship of the political process in general. That's, that's what this is going to be in the flavor of. And uh, so just thoughts of, hey, what does it mean uh, for those of us who live in a representative republic? Uh, what, what does it mean to be faithful stewards of the political process? Um, you may say, Brian, I despise politics, or you may say, Brian, I live for politics, and I just want you to give me a thousand people to vote for. You, both of you will be disappointed by what I'm going to write because um, it's not that. Um, you know, I, I certainly do have uh, candidates that I am and am not supporting, just like you probably do too. Um, but this is a broader conversation, uh, just again about what does it mean to be a believer uh, who is blessed to be in a place where we do get a say in the political process. It's something that we can't take for granted. A lot of folks don't have that. And so uh, wanna, we wanna use that well, steward that well, okay? So that'll be, look for that, come into your email inbox here, like I said, between today uh, and Tuesday. I know early voting's open. Most of you probably haven't voted yet. Uh, if you have, it's okay. Take this, if you find it valuable, pass it on to somebody that hasn't voted yet. To kind of inform uh, their thoughts as well. So our reading this morning is from Ephesians 1. Uh, once again, 3 through 14. So we'll be reading this again today and then one more time next week. So by that time, you probably won't have this thing ground in your head, and I say good. I want it to be uh, for all of us, all right? So Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Let's hear God's word together. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray for us. Father, please help us. Uh, now this morning we ask, give us grace, give me clarity as I preach. Help us all hear the things uh, that you have for us today. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Sergeant York, his life, legend, and legacy as John Perry's biography of the World War I uh, hero, Alvin York, later portrayed by Gary Cooper uh, in the movie from the early 1940s entitled Sergeant York. Now, while the book goes into York's war exploits, which is what everybody always wants to think about, uh, it spends a lot more time actually discussing his home life in Pall Mall, Tennessee, uh, which is up in the Appalachian Mountains, east side of the state, near the Kentucky line. Uh, and, and a good deal of that story revolves around his courtship of and eventual marriage to his longtime sweetheart, Gracie Williams, the prettiest girl in the Wolf River Valley. Uh, Perry tells of one particularly tender moment shortly before York is shipped off to war. Uh, to war. Uh, he and Gracie, at, at this point, they're just boyfriend and girlfriend. Uh, they walk out one evening to this spot in the woods that they like to meet up at. It's on one of the hills surrounding the valley, and it's evening, and down below there's these kerosene lamps 
or twinkling in the cottage windows, something like a Norman Rockwell painting. There are tears shed, promises made. He knows he's about to go to war. They both know what that could mean. And Alvin swears his love to Gracie. And he promises that he will never look at another girl while he is in the theater of war because he knows he's going to be in Europe for a long time. And she promises that she will not let another boy in the valley kiss her. That's the specific promise that she makes. And so as he's making all of these promises, he tells her one day, one day, I'm going to be able to fully express my love for you. I'm going to marry you. I'm going to care for you as long as we both shall live. And throughout the rest of the book, he does just that. As much as he's done for those around him, for friends and strangers, and that's also a lot of what the book covers is his love for his neighbors. Really what you keep coming back to, what I found particularly profound, is that he keeps coming back to what can I do for Gracie? What can I do for my bride? And he cares for her for decades and decades. See, everything he said that night on the hill overlooking the Wolf River Valley wasn't just empty words. It was backed up by what he did. Of course, that's how we gauge love, right? Not just by words or intentions or even feelings, as important as all those things may be. We ultimately judge love. It's sincerity. It's measure by what is actually done for the beloved, right? It comes back to actions. Today, we're in our seventh week uh, in our series, But God, a walk through Ephesians. Left to ourselves, Paul tells us uh, we're lost, we're condemned, we're headed for ruin. What we deserve at bottom is God's judgment, his justice, but God. He refuses to let things stand that way. He loves us too much for that. And this letter makes that abundantly clear. But he doesn't only tell us that God does love us. Of course, he says that over and over again. But he tells us what God has done for us. He sent Jesus to rescue us through his life and death on our behalf. Uh, this is the definition of love. As theologian John Stott says, if we're looking for a definition of love, we should look not in a dictionary, but at Calvary. We've stressed that point over and over thus far in this series. I don't know how many times I've said it, and we'll keep coming back to it. But, but today and next Sunday, as we're wrapping up Paul's introduction here in verses 3 through 14, we're going to step back. We're going to see the scope, the scale of God's love for us in Christ at kind of a more holistic uh, view. In other words, trying to see, we've been looking at a lot of trees. We're going to try to see the forest as well today and next week. So today we're going to see that in Christ we have an inheritance. Okay, that's the first way that we're going to see God showing his love to us. In Christ we have an inheritance. And then we're going to see that in Christ we are billboards of God's glory. Okay, in Christ we have an inheritance. And in Christ we're billboards of God's glory. And then next week, we're going to see that in Christ, God has given us his spirit. All right, so today, in Christ, we have an inheritance is where we'll jump in. In 2007, uh, 70 people in Lisbon, Portugal, each received an astonishing notification. A man by the name of Luis Camara, now his name is actually like 10 names long, but just trust me, you don't want me to try to pronounce all of it. Uh, but Luis Camara uh, had died, and each of these people had received a portion of his estate as an inheritance. Uh, suddenly, the financial lives of every one of these people was substantially improved. Now, not, not crazily so. Um, you can take almost any fortune and divide it by 70 and then pay taxes on it, and it's not going to be that much. But still, it was pretty nice. As we dive into our text this morning, Paul writes this. In him... We have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the counsel of his will. All right, so just like for us, the concept of inheritance was pretty common uh, in the first century Roman Empire. We actually have written records of inheritance laws going back 4,000 years uh, in Mesopotamia, which is, uh, so that's essentially Palestine and East, so where most of the Bible was written. 
and in Roman law, there are a lot of things about inheritance as well. So Paul's audience would have known exactly what he was getting at. Now, I've done this in one or two of our prior sermons in Ephesians, but I want to set the scene for you again just to try to help you understand uh, the significance of what Paul is writing here. I want you to put yourself for a minute in the shoes of one of Paul's recipients. So from what we know of the demographics of the Roman Empire in general and of Christians in particular in the first century, this probably describes you. Okay, so if you're, if you're in one of those churches Paul writes to, this is probably your life, all right? You are a subject of the government. Only about 3% of people living in the Roman Empire in that part of the empire in the first century were actually citizens. Otherwise, you were at best a subject. You had no rights, no real privileges other than what you could kind of glean uh, from living near a metropolitan center in a relatively stable society. You may have been a slave, as were about 27% of the population. Uh, now, slavery in the first century Roman Empire was a lot better uh, than the chattel slavery that we're familiar with in America's past, but it was still not a picnic. You still had no rights. You were the property of someone else. More than likely, you were relatively poor, uh, as were most early Christians. You, you wouldn't have been living paycheck to paycheck. You would have been living hand to mouth, I mean, every day, hoping you could scrap by. Uh, you would likely have had very, very little of what we would call social influence or power. Uh, with only a few exceptions, there weren't many movers and shakers in the early church. There were some, but very, very few. Uh, you were probably a Gentile. So while your church would have had some Jewish believers, uh, most likely you would have come from a pagan religious background which would have instilled in you this servile fear of the gods on one hand or just kind of a superstitious sentimentalism or maybe even cynicism on the other. So this is your life. Doesn't sound like very much. Does anybody, does that sound good to anybody in here? You want to trade places with any of those folks? No. But now you've come to faith in Jesus and Paul tells you that you have, quote, obtained an inheritance. Talk about a message that you need to hear. And it's not just any inheritance. It's not something perishable, something that could be taken away or something limited like the inheritance was that I mentioned just a few minutes ago. No, no, it says our inheritance is, what does it say? In Him. In Him. As we've said the last several weeks, takes us back to that doctrine of union with Christ. When we put our faith in Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus' identity becomes our own. Okay? Paul, who references this almost 200 times in his 13 letters, puts it most succinctly in 2 Corinthians 5.21. I've quoted this in past weeks. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And as he unfolds that teaching throughout the New Testament, man, he hits us with one staggering claim after another. We get credited for the life that Christ lived. We get credited for the death that he died for us. He says that we've been crucified with Christ. We've been raised with Christ. We're now seated with Christ in heaven. And as he is the rightful heir of all things, his creator and sustainer and Lord and Savior, Paul tells us over in Romans and in Galatians that we are fellow heirs with him. He who is the rightful recipient of all things, the one upon whom all glory and blessing and honor is due in some mysterious sense, shares that with us. Now, if you're like me, when I read that, that, that seems like a bit too much. Like you kind of want Paul to reel it in a little bit. You're like, Really? Paul? Right, really? Is it, is it that good? And he would tell you, yes. It is. The message is that good. It's that profound. This is what God has done for us. In fact, because any inheritance that we receive as followers of Jesus ultimately points us back to God and His grace, the inheritance we receive is really at root God Himself. We're getting Him. 
See, as Jesus enjoys unbroken, perfect fellowship with the Father, that's what he gives us as well. Just as the Old Testament proclaims that God takes people as a possession, as an inheritance for himself, so we take him as our inheritance and our possession. I want you to listen to Revelation 21, 3, and 4. It gives us a picture of this dynamic. Uh, John writes about the new Jerusalem, fully bloomed, consummated, this home where believers will enjoy forever. And he says this, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. See, that's a glimpse, just, I mean, a glimpse of what it means to be fellow heirs with Christ. That's what it means for us to have our inheritance in Him. But there's more. Back to that inheritance story that I mentioned just a few minutes ago. What I didn't tell y'all was how all this came about. See, Luis Camara was an eccentric, wealthy, really wealthy aristocrat. And at the age of 29, he decided that he wanted to create a will in the event of his untimely demise. Now, for whatever reason, and I never got a good answer for this, but for whatever reason, wills are not commonplace in Portugal. People just don't do that. And yet, he insisted on doing that very thing. So, he went to the office of a local civil servant, and he had two government employees come and witness what came next. Y'all ready for this? Here's what he did. Walked into the office, brings the two employees in, takes out a Lisbon phone book, and opens it. And at random, begins to point out names. He would say the name, the name would be transcribed, and when he got to 70, because I guess that was a nice even number, he stopped, and he said, those are the people who will receive the inheritance. Paperwork's formalized, signed, filed with their proper authorities, and the rest is history. 13 years later, at the ripe old age of 42, Kamara passed away, and his inheritors began receiving phone calls. As cool as that story is, it, it does lack something, right? It lacks kind of a personal touch. You see, th this was completely an impersonal act, right? It was random. Uh, the checks that these people received had nothing to do with Kamara's care, let alone love for them. They just happened to occupy the right lines in the phone book. But the inheritance that we receive as believers is anything but random. Paul says the reason that we've obtained it is because we have, look back at your text, been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And I went into a lot of detail about these same phrases a few weeks ago when we discussed verse 5, so I'm not going to go here again in depth. You can go back and watch the video if you want to. I'm going to limit, though, my comments here to, to, to two that we really do need to grasp. And I've, again, I've mentioned these before, but repetition is the mother of learning, so we're going to go over them again. A couple of things. First, whenever Scripture discusses predestination, it is meant to encourage God's people. You hear that? Whenever script, every time Scripture discusses predestination, it is meant to encourage God's people. Folks love arguing about predestination, all right? They do. How does it work? How can we be responsible while God is still in control? I mean, those are good discussions to have to a degree, but too often we miss the overarching point that the Bible is making. See, when it talks about predestination, it's meant to be a blessing and a comfort to us who know, look, we know our own hearts too well. We're therefore tempted to what? Despair, right? If you look at your own track record, it's real tempting about there's no way God could ever want to save me. 
Or if maybe you're looking at your background and you're thinking, you know, I, I haven't really been loved or chosen for anything in my entire life. Why would God want me for anything? See, that's where the doctrine of predestination comes in. That God has chosen. If your hope is in Jesus, God has chosen you for that. He loves you. He wants you for his own, specifically. Not because of anything you've done, not because of who you are in yourself, but because of who he is in himself. And if you're not a believer today, if you say, okay, I'm not a Christian, then I just tell you this, run to Jesus today. Trust in him. Trust that he died for your sins and was raised again, that he took the punishment that your sins deserve, and that he is right now, listen, he's right now inviting you to trust him. And when you do, you can know that you too have been set apart, that you've been chosen. He wanted to make you his own. Okay, that's the first thing I want you to see. It's really, really important. The second one is to, second is this, God is sovereign. Okay, he's sitting in heaven, ruling and reigning right now. Okay, right now. He was determined to make you his own. Nothing and nobody, not this world, not the devil, and not even you can thwart his purpose. He works, what does the text say? all things according to the counsel of his will. And that means that we can trust him with our salvation, with our eternal hope. So he's strong enough to save us, and he's strong enough to keep us. And that means we can trust him with everything else that happens in our lives as well. As hard as they may be sometimes, we can trust that his hand's not off the wheel. He hasn't fallen asleep. He's not surprised. He's not caught off guard by anything happening to us. So the inheritance we have in Christ is covered in this beautiful confidence of God's loving, personal, predestining sovereignty. That's the kind of inheritance we have. Not, not random or limited, but specific and inexhaustible and beautiful. That's our inheritance in Christ. All right, but not only do we have this inheritance in Christ, in Christ we're also billboards of God's glory, and that's what I want us to look at now. Every year, 39 million people pass through Times Square in New York City. Uh, I can still remember the first time we visited there back in 2006, and going there for the first time, it is absolutely overwhelming. The busyness, the clamor, the energy. I mean, we went, it was Black Friday of 2006. I mean, day after Thanksgiving. You can't imagine the amount of hustle and bustle going on. It's truly something. But you know, in the midst of all the clamor and the business, you know what we noticed more than anything else, or at least what I noticed more than anything else? The same thing everybody else notices more than anything else. The billboards. The signage. All the way back into the 1870s, when Times Square was actually known as Longacre Square, and was the hub of the city's carriage trade. The whole thing has been plastered with signage. Uh, in 1941, a camel cigarette billboard about half a block long, uh, blowing steam meant to look like smoke out of a model's mouth, first appeared. The high tech back then, you can Google it and see an image of this. Uh, and that ran until 1966. And a sign with that kind of technology appears quaint now, though, as the square is dominated by electronics blazing, signs in every shape and format you can imagine. I mean, look at it today. Take a second and just Google Times Square like today, currently. You will be blown away by the, the shape and size of the signs. Uh, the current size champion is at 1535 Broadway. It is eight stories tall and 125,000 square feet. It wraps around the edge of a building, advertising everything from Google to the latest fashion trend, and for around $3 million a month, you too can rent that sign. In this passage, Paul tells us that as believers, that we have the same fundamental purpose. It says that we are billboards of God's glory. Okay, look first with me at the end of verse 4, and we're going to go through the end of verse 6. Okay, from the end of 4 through the end of 6. 
Now, we went over these verses in previous weeks, but I want to point out to you how Paul's repeating this theme. It says, In love he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. Now look at verse 12. So that we who were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Finally, look at verse 14. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory? So three times in 12 verses, in in these verses, Paul repeats essentially the same phrase. And each time he uses it, it's surrounded, if you notice, by inheritance and adoption language. This language of God making us a part of his family through the person and work of Jesus. And God's done this, Paul says, why? To demonstrate, to magnify, to billboard, so to speak, His glory. Now, when the Bible talks about God's glory, it's referring to His essential nature and character. The word glory uh, in in the Hebrew Old Testament, kabod, uh, it, it literally means like weightiness or presence. In fact, if you would have asked a Hebrew, if, if you would have cut open an animal and pointed to the, to the liver of that animal, and you would ask them what that is, they would say it's its kabod. It's its heavy organ, right? So the idea was that when you would see the word glory, it was about the weight and the significance of, of, a, of a special presence. And so when the Bible talks about God's glory, it's talking about his presence, who he is, his essential nature. Simply put then, God has saved us to demonstrate who he is. Does that make sense? Track with me so far? All right. He wants to be loved, worshipped, and glorified as, here's the thing you need to hear, as the God of grace, as the Savior. Yes, he is praiseworthy because of his works in creation and because of his justice and because of all of his attributes. And Scripture calls us to praise him for those facts, for who he is. However, as Paul stresses here, and as the rest of the Bible demonstrates repeatedly, the primary thing that God wants to be known for, okay, the, prim- the main thing that he wants to be known for is for saving sinners. Uh, the old Anglican Book of Common Prayer that we use most weeks in our bulletin, uh, it says this, O oh God, one of the prayers says this, O oh God, you declare your almighty power, okay, so come on his nature there, you declare your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. That's, that's dead on. That's the scriptural reflection of what God wants primarily to be known as. And he wants to use us to get that message across. Think back again to those Times Square signs. Okay, that, that camel sign that I mentioned a few minutes ago, this iconic billboard that sat for over 20 years on Times Square, it would have the picture of the model, and every so often that model would change, like during World War II, uh, sometimes it was a sailor. Sometimes it was an infantry, infantry soldier. So always somebody different. Uh, and so it would have, it would say camel cigarettes. They have the model that's blowing out the steam. And beside it, it would say, it said, costlier tobaccos. In other words, like, all our competitors are cheap. We're the good one. We're the one you really want. Or today, if you're on Times Square and you see one of the billboards that Gap has rented, and it's got some model who's probably like skinnier than this post here, but like some model like wearing some kind of super hip clothes and what's the message they're trying to get across? Like this is what beauty's supposed to look like and this is, this is the height of fashion. Or if you look at the, the most iconic of all the signs on Times Square that's on one Times Square, that skinny building at the, at the end of the square, it's got the big Coca-Cola sign that's never changed. And so when you see that, people look at it, and because it hasn't changed, because it's just their word mark, what it's always been, people look at that and say, aha, stability, long-term success. You see, every one of those billboards is designed to say something specific about the thing that they're advertising. And God has made us billboards for His glory. See, as we trust Him, as we praise Him, as we obey Him, as we gather to worship Him, we're glorifying the one who would spare no expense 
to save us. And as others see that and see how we live, imperfectly as it is, how we adore, how we love, how we praise, how we struggle to believe even when we don't want to, how we insist on still praying when we would rather just whine and complain, how we continue to make our reference point Him, as people see that, well, they're seeing the gospel message and hearing the gospel message as we explain that to them so that perhaps they too will believe and become billboards of His glory as well. You see, God's love in Christ not only provided us with an inheritance, but it creates countless walking billboards who in the process of celebrating His love and grace become conduits for others to experience it as well. Today as we wrap up, I want to tell you a true story about one of our fellow billboards. She's not alive anymore. Uh, this is a true story that I came across about 20 years ago. Uh, a handful of you know this. Uh, I've shared it with you back during the summer of 2020, but there weren't many of us gathering for worship then, so you probably haven't heard it. Uh, and if you did, you might have forgotten it. So I want to tell it to you again. Uh, when, the first time I heard it, it blew me away, and it stayed with me over the years. I have to talk to you about this lady once again this morning. This is taken uh, from John Ortberg's book, The Life You've Always Wanted, and I hope it blesses you today. Uh, these are the words of John's friend, Tom Schmidt. I'm going to read this for you again. Hope you love it. It's a lengthy quote, but I promise it's worth it. <clears throat> the state-run convalescent home is not a pleasant place. It is large, understaffed, and overfilled with senile and helpless and lonely people who are waiting to die. On the brightest of days, it seems dark inside, and it smells of sickness and stale urine. I went there once or twice a week for four years, but I never wanted to go there, and I always left with a sense of relief. It is not the kind of place one gets used to. On this particular day, I was walking in a hallway that I had not visited before, looking in vain for a few who were alive enough to receive a flower and a few words of encouragement. This hallway seemed to contain some of the worst cases, strapped onto carts or into wheelchairs and looking completely helpless. As I neared the end of this hallway, I saw an old woman strapped up in a wheelchair. Her face was an absolute horror. The empty stare and white pupils of her eyes told me that she was blind. The large hearing aid over one ear told me that she was almost deaf. One side of her face was being eaten by cancer. There was a discolored and running sore covering part of one cheek, and it had pushed her nose to one side, dropped one eye, and distorted her jaw so that what should have been the corner of her mouth was the bottom of her mouth. As a consequence, she drooled constantly. I was told later that when new nurses arrived, the supervisors would send them to feed this woman, thinking that if they could stand this sight, then they could stand anything in the building. I also learned later that this woman was 89 years old and that she had been here bedridden, blind, nearly deaf, and alone for 25 years. This was Mabel. I don't know why I spoke to her. She looked less likely to respond than most of the people I saw in the hallway. But I put a flower in her hand and said, here is a flower for you. Happy Mother's Day. She held the flower up to her face and tried to smell it. And then she spoke. And much to my surprise, her words, although somewhat garbled because of her deformity, were obviously produced by a clear mind. She said, thank you. It's lovely, but can I give it to someone else? I can't see it, you know. I'm blind. I said, of course, and I pushed her in her chair back down the hall to a place where I thought I could find some alert patients. I found one, and I stopped the chair. Mabel held out the flower and said, here, this is from Jesus. That was when it began to dawn on me that this was not an ordinary human being. 
She had grown up on a small farm that she managed with only her mother until her mother died. Then she ran the farm alone until 1950 when her blindness and sickness sent her to the convalescent hospital. For 25 years, she got weaker and sicker with constant headaches, backaches, and stomach aches. And then the cancer came too. Her three roommates were all human vegetables who screamed occasionally but never talked. They often soiled their bedclothes and because the hospital was understaffed, especially on Sundays when I usually visited, the stench was often overpowering. Mabel and I became friends over the next few weeks, and I went to see her once or twice a week for the next three years. Her first words to me were usually an offer of hard candy from a tissue box near her bed. Some days I would read to her from the Bible, and often when I would pause, she would continue reciting the passage from memory, word for word. On other days, I would take a book of hymns and sing with her, and she would know all the words of the old songs. For Mabel, these were not merely exercises in memory. She would often stop in mid-hymn and make a brief comment about lyrics she considered particularly relevant to her own situation. I never heard her speak of loneliness or pain, except in the stress she placed on certain lines in certain hymns. It was not many weeks before I turned from a sense that I was being helpful to a sense of wonder, and I would go to her with a pen and paper to write down the things she would say. During one hectic week of finals exams, I was frustrated because my mind seemed to be pulled in 10 directions at once with all of the things that I had to think about. The question occurred to me, what does Mabel have to think about hour after hour day after day, week after week, not even able to know if it's day or night. So I went to her and I asked, Mabel, what do you think about when you lie here? And she said, I think about my Jesus. I sat there and I thought for a moment about the difficulty for me of thinking about Jesus for even five minutes. And I asked, what do you think about Jesus? She replied slowly and deliberately as I wrote, I think about how good he's been to me. He's been awfully good to me in my life, you know. I'm one of those kinds who's mostly satisfied. Lots of folks wouldn't care much for what I think. Lots of folks would think I'm kind of old-fashioned, but I don't care. I'd rather have Jesus. He's all the world to me. And then Mabel began to sing an old hymn, Jesus is all the world to me my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him, I would fall. When I am sad, to him I go. No other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He's my friend. Did you hear all that? You listening there? Hope so. Whether she would phrase it like this or not, Mabel was utterly confident of her place in God's family and of the inheritance that she had in Christ. And there from that nursing home, she was a billboard, right, that passed from Tom Schmidt to his friend John Ortberg to John Ortberg who wrote that book to me who read it to now I'm telling you about it. Do you see the ripple effect? Because Mabel was a billboard. And this, Tom Schmidt wrote that in like 1975. Because she was a billboard before I was even born. We're here talking about it today. And who does that inexorably point us back to? To her Jesus and to the God who sent her Jesus, right? Walking billboards. See, the gospel, the good news that Jesus died for our sins, it's what shaped Mabel's entire life. And I pray it'll do the same thing for us today. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, again for our time together. And we pray that your spirit uh, would, would work in our hearts, would bring us the grace that we need to see, to believe, to own these beautiful, glorious promises that we have. Father, we ask 
uh, that today you would help us as uh, we go through all the things in life that get our attention, uh, a lot of good things, uh, a lot of bad things, a lot of things that we wish uh, we didn't have to deal with. Um, but whatever it is that we may be involved in, that we may uh, need to, to concentrate on, Father, we pray that always you would bring us back to our inheritance in Christ, that you've made us to be uh, billboards. And that's the most loving thing that you could do for us because as we concentrate, as we think about those truths, it brings us to love you more and more, and it brings us more hope and joy and peace. And so we thank you that you've made us uh, billboards of the gospel, and we ask that you would help us to be that to one another and to our friends and neighbors who don't know you. Help us now, we ask, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.